Welcome to the Wednesday, January 11th meeting of the Burlington Board of Electric Commission. My name is Lori Lemieux and I'm the board clerk and due to the resignation of our commission chair, Gabrielle Stebbings at the December meeting, our first order of business is to elect officers. At this time, I open up the, for no, the floor for nominations for chair of the commission. I'll nominate uh, Commissioner Moody for chair. Do I have a, se oh, do I have a second? Do, are there any other nominations? Okay. Hearing none, I'll move to a vote. By the show of hands, please indicate your support for Commissioner Moody. Thank you. Of the five members present, four votes were cast in support of Scott Moody. Congratulations. I'll turn the meeting over to you for the election of the vice chair. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I'll open up nominations for vice chair. I'd like to nominate. I mean, Vice Chair. <laughs> Do we have any? Second. Second. We have one nomination for uh, Commissioner Whitaker. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, I'll, uh, by a show of hands, take uh, who says Commissioner Whitaker is Vice Chair. Thank you. All right. All right, that uh, being concluded, thank you everyone. Um, I appreciate it. I uh, not, don't know how ready I am for this, but I will certainly be uh, looking forward to all of your input and help and guidance uh, along the way. Um, so, and then also, uh, the first one of the first things I want to do is welcome all of you to the meeting. Of this, uh, the Board of Commissioners meets every uh, uh, second Wednesday of the month at 5.30 at here at uh, 585 Pine Street, as always welcome, uh, the public is welcome. Please come, uh, have your voice heard, um, questions, concerns, praise, whatever, you're always welcome here. Uh, moving on, the first thing I'd like to do is welcome our new uh, commissioner, Commissioner Bond. Welcome to the group. Um, again, I'll be looking forward to your expertise. I looked you up and uh, you have a lot of, a lot of uh, wealth of knowledge in this uh, arena, so we uh, look forward to working with you. And, uh, there's no no dumb questions speak up jump in and uh, welcome aboard um, <clears throat> to that um, uh, hopefully the uh, staff will be giving her some catching her up on some of the more latest things that we've been doing and kind of getting her up to speed on some of the topics we've been dealing with um, district energy and Alan Bierke and a few other things that hopefully she'll get the materials for that all right uh, next thing up is the agenda. Do we have any changes, uh, substantive changes to the agenda? None. Hearing none, I'll uh, entertain a motion. No, we don't need a motion for the agenda. No? No. no. Oh, well, other places we do, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, minutes. Uh, yeah, that's what I was looking for. Uh, see, I'm already starting this off in the bad foot. Uh, minutes for December. Any sub substantive changes to the minutes that? Well, I, uh, have, I have one question. I think sure. Uh, at the top of page three, first paragraph, it says, "If a permit were pulled, does that mean revoked?" I'm sorry. Uh, do I yeah, it's it uh, page three of the minutes, the topmost paragraph. Page three. Uh, about two, three. It's two, three. We propose that if a permit were pulled, is pulled being revoked? No, no, no permit. Uh, essentially, if a permit was requested, was filed for. Okay, well, I would suggest changing that to requested. This is right. Yes. Okay. Okay, I will. I will change that, Bob. Any other changes to the minutes of December fourteenth? Hearing none, I will entertain a motion. Motion to accept the minutes for December 14th. December 14th. <laughs> second. Here, motion and a second. Um, discussion on the motion. Hearing none. Um, I'll uh, everyone. Uh, God. All in favor of the minutes of December 14th. No. Signify by saying aye. Uh, you don't have to do that. You don't need to do that. No. Okay. All right. Uh, public forum. Are there any members of the public here? I'm so used to doing that with other boards. Uh, no one. Anybody online? Uh, no. 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 Just employees. Okay, no one here for public forum. Again, um, public is always welcome here. Your concerns, 
um, and thoughts and stuff on the department and how we're doing. Um, 585 Pine, um, second one. Commissioner's Corner. Um, do commissioners have anything to bring up? Uh, as long as we have an opportunity. Curious about the um, streetlight thing. Who was going to, it was a subgroup of folks that were going to talk. I, I don't know. Yeah, if I'm, I'm, I'm okay. going to ask about that in just a second because that's okay. kind of a, yeah. Are you, are you asking now? I guess. I just <laughs> want to make sure there's no other, other um, commissioner um, comments or anything. Okay. Oh, sorry, Willie. Okay. Um, thanks to James for sending me a memo about the connection between diesel prices and wood prices. I, I believed you when you told me last time, but you made it look very convincing in what you sent me, so thank you. Um, that's it. And then I've got one, just one small thing that the, um, the department was changing out lights on my street. Um, and got to the one in front of my house. And I've got to tell you that the difference in, um, you know, what in that light is, 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 it's like night and day. They put a new light in there, and the, um, <clears throat> not only does it, it light the street, the, the, the street very well, the sidewalk very well, it spills into my, but it's the, the color temperature is so soft in my bedroom, it's <laughs> much more, much more um, tolerable than those orange. Mm -hmm orange one so um, I'm, I'm loving it thanks that good to hear that we, we've done some work uh, we had gotten a front porch forum post I think relative to DeForest uh, as well that that kind of talked about the orange color lights and those are the older lights and uh, Munir and and his team worked uh, very quickly to replace those with the newer LED which have I think a more of a soft color uh, temperature and do a better job of lighting so probably same same kind of setup and uh, this was an instance where somebody had been complaining that the street wasn't lit enough um, and that when they rode their bike down, they couldn't see where they were going. And so we were immediately able to do that. And then we're working on incorporating that one into our, our street lighting plan. But uh, um, more broadly, I think with the uh, street lighting issue, um, we did have uh, some follow up from uh, our former chair uh, who, who remains interested in introducing us to uh, a person locally who has some expertise and I think uh, Munir uh, has been in touch with her over email. We're trying to set up a meeting so that we can benefit from whatever uh, expertise might be out there uh, in terms of learning more. And um, we do have a new director of engineering on board, um, uh, Paul Nadu, who, Nadeau, Nadu? Nadu. Paul Nadu, uh, who comes to us from Green Mountain Power. Uh, it doesn't have a background necessarily in street lighting uh, issues, so for the time being, I think. Uh, Munir and Ennis uh, on our team are going to be uh, continue to be the lead on that issue. And does that include uh, connecting with Gabe Arnold? That's the local expert who I think yeah. Gabrielle had hoped to connect us with. Okay, but is, is it through her or is it through somebody here? Through, through her. Okay. Yep. I have a, an email from her. Okay. Uh, I've also, well, one last thing on that. <clears throat> I mentioned there was some work in a small town in Massachusetts, Pepperell, and um, there's a fellow there that's still making measurements that probably will be of use to us. Okay. And I just, I, you know, mentioned that I think we have capital work that's planned for the spring, correct, Muneer? So we're, yes. we're interested to get additional feedback. Um, we, we paused that obviously during the winter time and waiting to kind of resolve some of this. Uh, uh, with the discussion, but so over the next couple months, hopefully we can get some feedback, learn if there's additional flexibility within the uh, IES standards, and then uh, find a way to proceed uh, with the capital plan uh, or, or some version of it. Um, so that's kind of where things are, at least on our end. That's helpful. Anything else from the commissioners? Yep, let me just make sure I, yeah, how, how I can The new light is brighter it does shine in your bedroom, but yeah. it's got such a nice it's, warm color temperature that it's grooved. It's uh, yeah, it's a much more softer color temperature than that harsh orange. Okay, and is that still three thousand? Three thousand. Okay. It's replaced an HPS light. Yeah. But I mean, I also, I also see it as it also has a much more even um, blanket over the street and the sidewalk as well, um, and even what spills into my driveway. 
it's it's deceiving. It, it's it's it lights up my driveway, but it sort of looks dark. I don't know how to describe <laughs> that. It's both light and dark at the same time. It's yeah. I like Magic. it. I'm, I'm 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 happy with it. It's, it's an improvement. The better control of the light. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very pleased with it. So, do we put those lights in on what's that street? Um, scarf. Yeah, that's we did. They had that to begin with, that the one that caused the uproar, because it was the, the number. It's the number of fixtures as opposed to the light, I think, that okay. caused the issue okay. there. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think it was like 7 to 29 or something. It was a, yeah, it was a pretty more than three times dramatic seven. expansion. So perhaps we can. Are we good? As I was going to say. Yeah. No. I just would because I, I thought there was a meeting in December, and then I thought it got moved. I just was curious if there was any. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. yeah. Right. I, I mean, we can uh, potentially. I don't know if the date lines up with the next commission meeting, but if we've had that conversation with uh, the gentleman Gabe Arnold by that point, we can report back on what we've learned uh, at the February meeting, if that's helpful. Yeah. I mean, I was just going to leave it with whatever the time frame is that with. Uh, um, with Gabrielle and, and him and, and the new engineer, whatever that works out to be, just let us let us know, and then okay. we'll figure out who wants to be at that meeting and if we have to warn it and all that kind of stuff. If there's more than three, it has to be warned. So I think the intent, if I understood correctly, was that the conversation was more to share expertise than to have a public meeting about the topic separate from the commission oh, of under, understood yeah. but it just i think it still applies that if more than three of us are there uh, if more of than three commissioners were there it would become a public meeting um i gathered that it's wasn't a public the, meeting that we don't really want to be a public meeting well, kind of thing. no it was more that uh, my understanding and correct me if i'm if i got it wrong was um I think Gabrielle was hoping to just have Gabe be able to meet with our engineers essentially oh, not with directly. Okay. Um, there could be additional, you know, we could either discuss it at the public meeting for the commission or have an additional meeting about it. But my understanding from her was that, that was the idea, uh, was to connect Gabe with uh, Munira and the team so or that they not could. Not involve any of us. Is that uh, I don't want to speak on, on that. That's cool. I, I'm, I defer. I'm, I'm fine with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and uh, I think, I don't know if we have a date. Do we have, I don't know if we. Muneer sent some dates out, so we can certainly let you know when it's scheduled, and I defer to the commissioners and the former chair on how to line it up, if, if at all. So, you know, just an FYI, in the previous committee that we have developed the, uh, the IS, I mean, when we developed the standards, the standards uh, we had two of the commissioners on that subcommittee. Um, and Bob was one of them, and uh, I can't, can't remember who was the second one. Gene but Sullivan. Gene Sullivan, yes. So, yes. So really, the, the whole the whole purpose of it is not to have a public meeting, right? And the subcommittee would work and come up with whatever, and then we brought it back to the whole commission for review and their approval and discussions, obviously. Okay, but having said that, I'm uh, very interested in being there. I think you should be there. Okay. Yeah. So. Because there'll be a connection then between. Right. Yeah. 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 I think you should be okay. there. Maybe just, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. I'll, I'll defer to, okay. to, uh, to um, <coughs> yeah, I mean, Gabriel I as well. With the, uh, whenever I have the meeting, I can, send, uh, can invite Bob to. Perfect. Sounds good. All right, so that should dovetail nicely into the GM update. All right. Um, before I get into the items, I think covered in the report, uh, I mentioned that we have a new director of engineering. We also have a new uh, energy equity analyst, uh, Ida Menno, comes to us from the Department of Permitting and Inspections, uh, started this month as well, uh, is working with Jen Green and our sustainability team. And so uh, a couple of important hires for us. Uh, we continue to have a number of positions that are still unfilled, and in some cases we're having challenges still filling those positions, <coughs> but some success uh, for a couple that were important to us. So wanted the commission to be aware of that. Um, uh, I'll just go in order here. Uh, concept papers, we have no fewer than seven uh, Department of Energy uh, infrastructure bill concept papers that we're working on either individually at BED or as part of a group, uh, either statewide uh, in, in at least one case or with uh, another submitter in another case. Um, most of these are out. We have one that we're finishing up essentially tomorrow um, that we're going to submit as well. Our hope is one or more of them will be selected to have a full application. These are essentially, uh, you know, shorter form uh, and, and less upfront work so that we can get a sense from the department which of them, if any, uh, fit the priorities. But great opportunity there. 
Uh, most, not all, but most of the um, papers are really around complementing the work from the net zero energy revenue bond, uh, adding additional capacity uh, to the grid. Uh, if the commission recalls, the, the net zero roadmap had identified uh, essentially a series of pathways. Our 2020 integrated resource plan had um, analysis from Munir's team working with James's team that suggested that in 2019 dollars, we needed 19 to 24 million of grid upgrades to get to 102.8 megawatts. Uh, we've done some additional analysis as part of this to look at getting to 120 and 140 megawatts, and uh, some of that's being submitted as part of the paper um, with the idea that uh, it could be complemented by current net zero energy revenue bond funding, and if we do another tranche uh, in 2025, 2026, um, another bond as well. Um, so we'll keep the commission updated on that. Um, Can I just ask a question about that? Um, so for that, DOE money, is there like a local match, and that's what you would use the... Correct. Um, okay. Uh, it varies. In one case, I think it's as low as a third, if I'm remembering correctly, up to uh, more like 50% for most of them. But And then there's one where being a small utility, uh, which we definitely qualify for by their standard, uh, gets you uh, kind of a different set of criteria. There's like a third of the money uh, nationally is reserved for small utilities. So... There's different levels of match, but we essentially have match available primarily through the revenue. Yeah, level. and I wonder if that's, like, I think that's one of those things that's hard to communicate, but it's really important to to what the bond gives you the flexibility and the ability to do. But people right. don't really, I mean, it's hard to understand that. But, yeah. But, but being able to show local funds and not having to apply for the grant, then go out and get the money. Exactly. Um, no, makes a, a huge point. difference. Yeah. It's a great point. Um, and we've certainly stressed it in the applications to the department, but... To the extent we go back and ask voters again in several years uh, for something, uh, having this kind of flexibility with the money already kind of in process, but funding a portion of the need, not the entire need, it gives us this opportunity with the federal government uh, taking the active role that it's taking now, which is helpful. Um, and then uh, today, uh, actually, just a few hours ago in the truck bay, and we had our, our chair, our new chair, and congratulations, uh, Scott. Um, was there with us. Uh, we had a set of announcements uh, around our 2023 incentives. So we've done what we do every year where um, we look at the programs, we boost some incentives, we add some new programs. And then uh, this year we also tried to highlight the Federal Inflation Reduction Act uh, programs that are going to complement our local incentives. And uh, we had Maura Collins and the um, Vermont Housing Finance Agency with us. Uh, we have this new program. Tariff's been filed. It's um, pending at the PUC, but it's been approved for other utilities, so we're expecting that it'll hopefully be approved uh, for us as well. That allows us to do an on-bill finance repayment for heat pumps and weatherization. Uh, it's an income-qualified program uh, aimed at low and moderate income uh, customers. And the neat thing uh, here other than you know, very reasonable interest rates, the partnership with VHFA, is that it can break through the split incentive issue that we have where the tenant is paying the energy bill and the property owner has to pay for the improvements because the improvements can be paid for through this program. The property owner doesn't have to make the investment and the improvements and the savings stay with the meter. Um, so you know, the unit gets the improvement, the person paying the bill in the unit gets the savings. It's structured so it's cash flow positive, more savings than cost for the uh, person paying the bill. And it's going to unlock hopefully a new uh, opportunity for us to help. Uh, it's available for renters and homeowners, uh, but it could be uniquely helpful uh, for renters in Burlington. Um, so set of announcements there. Um, I won't go through all the details. We do have a press release out from the mayor. Um, but uh, at least in the heat pump and EV space, I would say there are some significant tax credits coupled with our incentives that can really make it quite more affordable than it's been uh, to purchase a new vehicle. Uh, we've got some charging incentives, both home, workplace, uh, that are going up or starting new. Uh, like for the first time this year, we have level three fast charger incentives uh, for workplaces. Um, we have one customer who's looking at that right now. And um, I'll mention, because I think it's in here as well, uh, we also have revenue bond investments for ourselves uh, in fast chargers, uh, 62.5 kW. Uh, we're going to be replacing the one out here on 585 Pine and one down at the Marketplace Garage 
that were older 25 kW Chatamo protocols, which only work with the Nissan Leaf and uh, some of the Mitsubishis, with uh, 62.5 kW, so significantly faster. And those are going to be CCS protocols that work with the vast majority of, of EVs. So those should be the first two new fast chargers, and then hopefully we'll see some more. Uh, we had an RFP go out. We have an electrician, uh, I think, who's been uh, part of that process, or multiple electricians who have been part of that process, and we're hopeful to get these installed in the next couple months. So look for those uh, soon. Um, <clears throat> next item on here, uh, this happened earlier this week at City Council. Um, we had unanimous approval from the Council uh, for BED and the Department of Permitting and Inspections recommendations regarding thermal policy and carbon fee. Uh, so town meeting day ballot will now have a question on it. I don't know which question number it'll be uh, yet. Um, related to uh, giving the city the authority to charge up to $150 per ton carbon fee um, for new construction and large existing buildings above 50,000 square feet uh, if they are uh, in new construction, pulling, requiring, uh, asking for a permit. Uh, and then uh, in the case of a uh, large existing building, if they're uh, requesting a permit for a new heating system or water heating system. Um, if voters approve this, it gives the council the authority under our charter change to make the fee a part of the proposal. We'd still have to go back and have an ordinance drafted post town meeting day uh, to implement this. But uh, this would be a fairly significant step forward on the policy front and build on the rental weatherization standards and the renewable heating ordinance uh, that we've done. And we've confirmed, because this was part of the conversation in Montpelier, there's a housing bill uh, that had language that might have preempted some of our work on this. And we've confirmed uh, through outreach through the city and now seeing a new draft that that bill no longer uh, would affect our rental weatherization, our renewable heating, or our charter change work. So we're, we're hopeful it'll remain that way. Um, but we've been proactive in trying to make sure that Burlington continues to have the authority we need to advance policy. Um, in addition, on the legislative front, um, uh, myself, Paul Pickna, Betsy Lesnikoski will be down in Montpelier tomorrow morning um, to host a coffee and meet with legislators, talk about the McNeil plant and the sustainability of our forestry operations, um, answer questions. Uh, we know that's of interest. Uh, we know that hopefully later this month um, or towards the end of the month, early next, uh, that we'll have discussions around extending Act 151, which allows us as an efficiency utility and efficiency Vermont to use a portion of our funding for emissions reduction projects uh, and not just electric efficiency. Um, and we also think that there will be discussions around um, renewable energy standard, which are not as uh, exciting for us, um, given the direction that some of it's being discussed, but we'll be engaged in those um, as well. So. Uh, we're going to be down in the House uh, Energy and Environment Committee, which is a new committee, uh, next Tuesday doing an introduction. Uh, I expect we'll be active during the session on a variety of topics. And lastly for me, um, I believe it's last, yes. Um, I just wanted to highlight in here, and I sent a few article links, uh, the December storms. We had a, a storm initially where our crews were helping GMP, and then we had the uh, storm right around uh, Christmas Eve, which was not particularly intense in Burlington, thankfully. We had a couple of outages, one of which went, I think, a little longer than an hour um, and had you know, a number of customers, hundreds of customers who were out, but we got them back on uh, within a couple of hours. We were able to send two crews uh, to Washington Electric. Uh, I think it was like 5 a.m. on the following day on Saturday. They were there through the holiday and into the next week helping restore power. Washington Electric was incredibly appreciative. Uh, they have the toughest service territory in the state. They are rural. Uh, they have homes that are spaced out quite a bit. They don't have like a geographically compact uh, area like we do and difficult conditions uh, and you know, getting a number of customers who had uh, outages back on. So uh, we really appreciated our crew's work there. I know Washington Electric did as well. And uh, they were highlighted in a couple of stories on CAX and, and Vermont Digger. Um, so I'll stop there, and uh, if there are any questions, happy to answer. So when you help another utility like that, is that just pro bono? Oh, no. <laughs> no, you charge them for that. No, it's, okay. uh, we have a program called Mutual Aid, um, <clears throat> okay. and uh, it, it's sort of a prearranged uh, set of terms that we can sign on to collectively. And so when we send a crew 
uh, their time and uh, the expense of whatever you know equipment we're sending uh, can be billed back to that utility. And then hopefully in this case, uh, this will be a FEMA reimbursement for the state as a whole, hopefully. Uh, so something like 75% of the cost can usually be reimbursed by FEMA in this circumstance. So Washington Electric will pay us uh, for the cruise time and our, our truck and whatever else, and then hopefully they'll be reimbursed up to 75% from FEMA. I, that makes sense. So, because obviously you can't use Burlington taxpayer resources somewhere else. Yeah, you'd end up in a, a situation where we were subsidizing other yeah. utility systems. So, this is a good long standing tradition. And um, every utility who needs mutual aid is happy to have the help um, and then to pay for it afterwards because it means their customers are getting back on more quickly. It does. Yeah, typically we work through NEPA, the New England Public Power, for, um, for outage response. Sometimes the American Public Power Association. Uh, we've had crews during just my six years here, we've had crews go uh, even outside of the continental United States when there have been storms in the Caribbean. Uh, we've had crews that have been asked to go to Arizona, to different, different states. But uh, typically our, our response is going to be either in Vermont or New England region. You know, but <clears throat> circumstances can pull you elsewhere. Yep. I, I know this is all uh, subject to flux, but uh, your memo last time said uh, $128 per ton per carbon. You mentioned up to 150 today. Ah. And uh, I'm, I'm not asking for a specific number, but uh, you might have even told us this. What's in there about how that can be modified over time? So the, the 128, I think, was a number that the state had been looking at for a social cost. The language in the ballot question is going to say up to 150 per ton and adjusted annually with inflation, which we would use the Northeast CPI, um, but no more than 5% annually. So after this would hopefully pass, uh, and obviously there's still a lot of work to do before you know that happens, um, but if it was to pass, uh, the council could come back and via ordinance set a number up to 150 a ton. Uh, they may choose a number lower. They could choose 100 or 125 or something. And then it would be uh, able to automatically adjust uh, with the cost of inflation, but no more than 5% annually uh, from there. Your memo also mentioned that New York and Boston had fees that are about twice that. Correct. Uh, they're more in the 200 to $260 range. They are the highest that I think we've seen, um, and there are certainly numbers that are lower. Uh, one uh, thing that I heard during the discussion was, and this is interesting, so we did our renewable heating ordinance uh, prior to this charter change uh, in 2021, and we essentially adopted an exemption process there for new construction to not have to put in a renewable heating ordinance uh, if they could show that there was no renewable option that was cost effective even using $100 a ton carbon price and even looking at all of our incentives. South Burlington subsequently adopted more or less verbatim with some additions our renewable heating ordinance and now had that $100 a ton figure. And so when we've been talking here about the 150, I have heard from some on the council that there might be interest in do, doing the $100 instead of the 150 because South Burlington has that and there's a desire to have symmetry uh, between our policies. So. Uh, we've certainly advocated for using the 150 um, because we think that that's closer in line to the social cost identified with the state, which has been somewhere in the 128 to 140 something range. Um, and obviously, the, using the higher number gives even more of a strong playing field to the renewable alternatives. But I would say, even if it ends up being 100, uh, it'll still have largely the similar effect of, of making somebody who's making an investment take a look at not just the baseline system, but baseline plus carbon fee compared to the alternatives. And um, uh, we did some analysis on the upfront capital comparisons, and there are a lot of renewable slash electric options that pencil out quite well from a capital standpoint against a baseline system plus carbon fee. And on the operating side, this is new and relatively uh, good news for us. Um, on the operating side, at least for residential customers, potentially some commercial, um, operating a heat pump, uh, for example, with um, our, our current rates compared to gas rates is becoming more favorable. Um, you can actually save money uh, heating with a heat pump now, whereas a few years back you would have definitely been uh, maybe break even or maybe losing some money by running on a heat pump. So rates change, commodity costs change, we're, we're in a more favorable position now on the operating side. Still thinking about the multifamily exemption, or is that off 
it, it's not an exemption, but we do have, um, uh, well, it's a, it's a delay essentially for the water heating component. Uh, so the language in the ballot question will say uh, for multifamily buildings, four units or larger, uh, the water heating component wouldn't come into effect for new construction until 2026. Um, and of course, one of the things we want to stress, and I hope if you all get asked, you can stress is this would not affect any existing uh, residential building of any kind, apartment, affordable housing, condo, single family, none of it affects those buildings. None of it affects any existing small business. None of it even affects a commercial or industrial building under 50,000 square feet. So we're talking about probably about 80 buildings in the city uh, that are above 50,000 square feet, uh, many of which are uh, the university, the hospital, Champlain, the school district in the city, um, and then new construction uh, buildings of all types that would happen starting in 2024. So it's important for us to continue to stress what's in and what's out. So the new high school then? Uh, yeah, although I think they are looking at uh, doing geothermal. Oh, okay. Uh, as an option, so we're hopeful that that will be uh, and they would have to do a renewable primary heating system either way because of the existing ordinance. And I know our team's been doing work on the option of looking at geothermal with them, which would be wonderful. I just had a quick question, <clears throat> sort of out of the blue that I've been thinking about for, for a minute. And last time I did one of these was years ago. Um, IRP, where are we at? Is, are, we the, are, we, are, we, are we due for one of those? Yes, September, right? September. Um, so our, our team's working on it. Uh, we're going through, uh, we'll do all the normal analysis that you would do for the IRP, and then we'll have uh, probably some additional work like we did last time. We had some focus areas. We'll have some additional focus areas as well. But uh, September uh, is the due date. Presuming we don't ask for any kind of extension. So we'll have to see. Uh, uh, and if there's interest, obviously we can brief the commission as we get closer to having a, a work product. Uh, to share ahead of submitting it, of course. Okay, so as you remember, in the past, we would have people on the commission as well as uh, sometimes a person in the public uh, help us kind of go through that whole process. And yep. Uh, uh, the last time that kind of that commission committee kind of fizzled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and the IRP happened anyway. The IRP is definitely on the PUC schedule, uh, so we, we have that. Uh, due date, but um, yeah, I don't know if uh, James or Emily have thoughts. Um, uh, if there's interest among the commission in, in being, uh, or a commissioner in being more involved, or whether there just be value in us briefing the commission on some of our findings ahead of time so that we can take your feedback before we submit, um, different ways to get, you know, input. What's the time scale? I, I mean, I know when you're going to start working on it or you're going to deliver in September? Deliver in September. Deliver in September. Okay. So you've been working on it. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if you have a preferred structure, if you'd like us to set a time maybe in the uh, later spring where we could come in and present before we, you know, finalize everything. Happy to put that on the agenda and we can make a note. That sounds like a good, okay. that sounds like a good uh, idea. We're making a note, I think. And uh, yes, we are. As we're on that, uh, what's, the, what's the time frame for our next uh, filing with the PUC? Uh, for rates? Yeah. Uh, we're still pending the current one. The current, all right. Uh, so we're waiting for that to be ultimately approved. Uh, we wouldn't file anything for a new rate until June 15th, um, which would let it take effect August 1st. And uh, we are still, we just kicked off our budget process for fiscal 24, so we don't have a number yet uh, to really kind of pin down what our need is. Um, we're facing some challenges. I know Emily's going to do the financials, but we're facing some challenges with the energy markets right now, not being as high as we had anticipated with the forwards uh, when we built the last budget. Um, the weather, as everyone notes, has been incredibly moderate. Uh, there's been very high, unseasonably high temperatures. Um, so outside of a few days, weeks in December where things spiked a bit, uh, prices have been much closer to shoulder season levels than even traditional winter, much less the winter that was uh, <coughs> expected. So that's having an impact on us right now. Um, we'll wait to see kind of over the next few months how that plays out and whether trends reverse. Um, and then that'll have an effect on how we look at our next budget and what type of cash on hand we're going into it with and all of that. Uh, but we'll be briefing you April and May um, on draft and hopefully final budget and rate as part of that. and then. We'll be bringing it to the Board of Finance City Council May, June. And if timing holds with consistent with our prior last couple of years, we'd be looking at June 15th or thereabouts for a filing. The next one. 
Mm -hmm. All right. I just want to make sure we capture um, Alan Bierke's concerns and have discussions about that, as well as any other little things that need to be tweaked. Yeah, and that that we've talked about relative yeah. to his. That's really the operating guideline. So it could go in with a, a rate filing if we wanted to, or it could go in as a separate project. Um, I think James and Andy Higby and Mike and others have been following up on some of the concerns that he had raised uh, over email. I don't have any new to report at the moment, but I'm certainly familiar. Really trying to scope out whether there is, whether the amount of time that goes into the requests that are being made is, is a justified amount or something that we would look at changing. Yeah. Okay. All set? All set. All right. Emily, you're up next with financials. This is the fun part. Great. Good evening, everyone. Welcome, Commissioner Bond. Let me share my screen. We see it over here on the laptop. I just, I just invited that to join. See if you can accept. Beautiful. The, the device is in that meeting, but I'm not in that meeting. That that screen is in that meeting. So I'm trying to get the screen into the meeting that I'm in. Um, I am sharing now. I can try calling that device. Yeah, I can try calling that device again. Okay, we'll do that. I think we might just want to. I'm going to hit continue on this one. This might be what we want. Uh, what Aha. Uh -huh. Kill your mic. <laughs> Feedback. It's not going to be a button. It's going to be something that I can We're good? No. I want to make sure that are you, uh, is Town Meeting TV okay with um, having access to the screen output? Yeah, we're, we're okay. You're okay. Okay. Wonderful. To my notes, get all that sorted. Oh, well, let me zoom that in a bit for you. There, hopefully that's a bit better. Okay, so um, for uh, Commissioner Bond's benefit, so I, there you have a full um, set of financial information for the month of November in your packets. Um, uh, myself or uh, c the controller, the controller position's vacant right now, so it's me, um, generally walks the commission through the financials for the most recently closed month. Um, so that would be November of 2022. Um, and I kind of go through the net income at a high level and usually the, the capital spending and the cash position and then sort of where our Moody's credit rating metrics are on a 12-month ended basis. Um, but there's lots more detail in your packet about 
you know, sales and power supply and capital project spending and all of that. Um, and, and happy to kind of give, give a little more detail on any of those things if you have questions as we go. So uh, for November, um, you will see that we had a net income. I'm trying to get my cursor over there. Oh, it's not going to work. Here we go. We had a net income of uh, $28,000 compared to a budgeted net income of $13,000. So we did $15,000 uh, better than budget. We do budget pretty carefully, like on a monthly basis, um, so that some months we have a budgeted net loss, some months we have a budgeted net income. Um, so it's not kind of a consistent, just take an annual amount and spread it out over 12. We try to account for the timing of various revenues and expenses. So there will be, you'll see quite a bit of uh, variation in the budgeted result for a given month. Um, uh, so how, how that positive variance came to be, um, sales were down this month, both commercial and residential, contributing to a negative variance of $150,000. Um, other revenues, which are primarily reimbursements to the operating front fund from our energy efficiency fund in the form of uh, when we pay out rebates, we, we BED operating are then reimbursed from the collections from the energy efficiency fund. Um, so those revenues to BED, so to speak, are offset in expense generally. Those were higher than budgeted by $297,000. Power supply revenues represent renewable energy credit revenues. We uh, retire some renewable energy credits from our generation, but we also sell higher value RECs from our generating resources um, to higher value markets in New England. And then we replace those with lower cost RECs to comply with Vermont's renewable energy standard. Um, as you can see, that's a significant part of our revenue budget at $8.4 million in FY23. Um, we are experiencing and forecasting to continue to experience a negative variance compared to budget for RECs or power supply revenues due to past periods of lower than budget production, lower than budget generation, um, particularly from our wind and Winooski One generation. Then moving to the expense side, uh, power supply expenses were favorable to budget by $417,000 in November. The power supply expense is um, that one line contains a number of other, you know, a number of uh, unique items sort of all related to power supply. So it's the fuel expense for McNeil, capacity charges, transmission charges, um, the uh, purchase power expense for our energy contracts, and then the sort of net um, settlement of the resources we provided versus the load we paid for from ISO New England, so the, the exchange. So all those things together <laughs> summed up to a positive variance of 417,000. Uh, we had increased fuel expense for the month of November, offset by favorable purchased power and transmission expense. We're continuing to see over budget capacity charges in large part um, due to the Mystic plant RNR. Uh, next line is the $177,000 negative variance to budget in operating expense. Um, this is labor, supplies, kind of the everything else line um, in this presentation. A lot of that is timing variances of purchases compared to budget. Um, depreciation and amortization is the expense we take on our capital assets. Um, taxes includes the payment to the city in lieu of taxes, um, as well as um, uh, sales and use taxes on our on our sales of electricity that has a fair favorable variant variance um, this year because the city's pilot came in lower than we had budgeted so we had a positive uh sorry we had a negative operating income it was better than budget but it was negative we'd budgeted an operating loss we did have an operating loss and then moving down to non-operating items 
other income and deductions is sort of a, a mix of both um, revenue and expense items that are non-operating. Um, that was $42,000 better than budget. We had more interest income than we budgeted because rates have risen, uh, which is a good thing. Um, and then there was offset in part by um, less co customer contributions to capital projects. So we had, um, uh, yeah, what am I trying to say? Oh, so yeah, year to date, that's the columns to the right. You can see we had um, so far through November an actual net loss of 143,000 compared to a budgeted net income of 278,000. So we're running $421,000 below budget. Um, we are actively forecasting every month kind of where we think we're going to end the year based on how the year has gone so far and kind of what people know about how things may be going for the spring as best we can. Um, our current forecast is uh, showing essentially a break-even net income, sort of a net income of zero, um, which is 1.1 million lower than budget. That forecast, however, does not assume a lot of uh, potential upside in the energy markets. So on the other hand, we have been experiencing a mild winter so far, which is creating actual results that are well below budget. So there still <coughs> remains, you know, the message is still, there's a lot of volatility and uh, it's quite weather dependent at this point. Um, we did see, uh, you know, a very high priced event um, over the, during the winter storm, for example, uh, but the mild weather is definitely not helping. So we'll continue to keep the commission updated and we're watching that um, year on forecast carefully. Um, especially the, the cash position, which is sort of a little more critical than the net income result. Any questions on any of that? I uh, just wanted to get a sense for how McNeil fits into this. McNeil had a 96% capacity factor that month, which sounds pretty good. And the strategy has been to dispatch McNeil when prices are high. It looks like it got dis dispatched, but I guess the point is the prices weren't high. Exactly right. Yep. They, they're certainly well above variable cost, but they're not as high as we're included. Yep. Okay, then I'll move to the capital spending. So here you can see that we had, at this point in the year, budgeted, budgeted to spend about five million of our 9.1 total capital budget for the fiscal year. We have actually spent about 4.1%. Um, we are experiencing quite a few supply chain challenges. Uh, materials are taking a lot longer. We are managing that as best we can by placing orders very early uh, so that we can keep on schedule. And um, you know, generally, I think we're managing that as well as can be given the uh, conditions. Um, and then I'll move down here. Uh, we, as you can see, our cash position at the end of April was around $5.6 million. That's uh, below the budgeted cash position that we had at this point in time of 9.1. So it's quite a bit down, um, and that's being driven by some of the things we've discussed, the softer energy prices, the lower rec revenues, um, and then some unbudgeted rec purchases that we made early in the fiscal year that will save us money in the long run, but, but used cash. Um, and then you can see at the bottom there the credit rating factors for November. Our debt service coverage ratio is set by our revenue bond resolution that was passed back in 1981 or four. <laughs> um, and that requires us to maintain a 1.25 revenue bond coverage ratio, or sorry, debt service coverage ratio. We're well above that and usually are at 3.14. Um, the adjusted debt service coverage ratio is the one that Moody's cares about. Um, that one is below where they'd like it to be around 1.2, 1.25. Generally, they really want it at 1.5, but we're happy if it's at 1.2 uh, in that neighborhood. That's at 0.89 for the 12 months ended in November. And then we have uh, 81 days cash on hand. We like to maintain 
uh, 90 on average. Happy to take any questions. So what, it, what the sales to customers is down, do you have any insights into that? Uh, I'm guessing it's weather. <laughs> Just warm or wet. But let me see if my, if looking at this page will confirm that. <laughs> If not, I'll have to get back to you. So there, we had, mm, so there were more budgeted cooling degree days. So that wasn't great. No, it doesn't look to be wet, actually. Oh, the average temperature was higher, so, yeah. So it's primarily weather driven. Mm -hmm. <coughs> which, which brings me to a question of, <clears throat> and I've noticed over the years, and we're talking about this last night, it's coming to be elsewhere. Winter doesn't really begin in Vermont till January, mid January. Um, so, why are we still thinking that we're going to get snow and uh, all this stuff in December? Why are we still planning for winters that are we're still thinking in terms of winters that we haven't had for the last 10, 15 years? It's a Christmas marketing you know? tool. I mean, I, I mean, hmm. I, I think. think a meteorologist, but <laughs> it's true in the Adirondacks, too. I, I can't speak to what you know people plan for in terms of snow and you know recreation, but I think for our budgeting purposes, temperature well, yeah, right yeah, is totally, what really yeah. matters. And we did see some cold weather in December, um, and we we saw higher prices. Even even it wasn't really that all that cold in Vermont terms, right? Um, it was cold enough. And of course, this was November. Right? This is November. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, yeah. I've actually watched these numbers. Uh, November. This one says it was five degrees above uh, expectation. That's reasonable. And December was three degrees above expectation. January has been the January has been way above what it should be so far to date. Yeah. So the question you may absolutely be like the warming trend, but then also the volatility and resilience, right? So like how. How do you budget or plan pay your IRP or whatever for that longer term resilience and volatility? Yeah, and just the key thing is is that with this budget, we really built it with the idea that the forwards that were in effect at the time that we built the budget were going to be the prices that we would see. We, I think we mentioned at the time, and we're seeing some of this play out, that there was some risk element to that um, because they we could end up with a more moderate set of temperatures. and. So far, on balance, that's been the case. Uh, it wouldn't take much of a cold streak for us to kind of get back on track uh, in terms of what the prices would be closer to, to budget. Um, but if we see the current trend continue through the winter, uh, we'll have, we'll have a, a significant challenge financially. So yeah, there's, there's the warming trend, there's, there's variability, um, and, then, you know, and then there's the energy markets, which you know, it could be, if we had a significant amount of additional redundant natural gas supply in New England, or if we built out a bunch more renewables, the price pressure might not be the same regardless of the temperature. But, so there's some interesting longer term trends. That would make budgeting easier. It would make us less revenue in all likelihood from our resources, but you might have a little more certainty around some of it. Um, the, the, you have lower vol volatility, but right. higher overall price. Yeah. I mean, the, the challenge for New England is we don't have enough natural gas to run the plants, and we don't have enough renewables coming online to deal with the challenge. Um, but that only really comes into effect when the weather gets colder right now. And otherwise, you know, if demand's low enough, you have enough. But I think in December, uh, what was it, a third of the generation was coming from oil uh, because it was colder. And the, in New England. Yeah, during during the cold snap. Yeah, about a third of the generation was coming from oil, which is it just something that's hard to contemplate. But, but we've seen Januarys where the prices were actually 20 or $30 a megawatt. This isn't, this isn't low prices. It's just not as high as they were projected to be very different animals. It's, it's an absence of extremely high prices, but still prices stronger than they've been for years. But we're talking about sales to customers, not the prices, right? Because you're saying sales to customers are also down. Well, they're, they're, they have some links. The, the weather affects the energy prices. Yeah, no, I get sales right, but energy. also we're electrifying more things. So there's two trends that we don't know how they collide or track necessarily. But if, if we have the same amount of customers, but we're electrifying more parts of our energy, that could 
best case scenario that keeps up with right. room trends. Or That's the idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Catch up as a new commissioner. Okay. Um, you mentioned um, the city's pilot came in lower. Can you just tell me, uh, give a frame of reference for what the city's pilot is you're referring to? Sorry, I, you payment in lieu. Of, I know. Payment in lieu of taxes. Okay. Yeah. Such a bad acronym because it sounds like it's something good. Right. There's a pilot program. What, what, yeah. Exactly. Right. That's right. what I always think. It's good for the city. <laughs> right. It's good yeah. for taxpayers. <laughs> yes. And then the last one was. Um, uh, you said less customer contributions to capital projects. Mm. Um, can you just yes, that? so it seems strange, but we are required by, I think it's government, I think it's the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, not the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, but one of those bodies sets, they both set accounting standards that we have to follow, and one of them <laughs> says that we need to record that as revenue. So. Um, uh, you know, the Shelburne Street roundabout or Main Street complete street upgrades, right? So the city's DPW is undertaking those improvements to, you know, improve the streetscape and provide all these other benefits, right? The same time, they might want decorative, nice looking street lights for, right? So they, what, however the, that project is being funded, a portion of that funding will come to BED to pay for our work to do any electrical work that needs to be done as part of that project, whether it's moving things out of the way, relocating, or putting in uh, new infrastructure, which you know, we will take the opportunity to do if we have a need in that same area. Um, so that's the sort of customer contributions to construction, which tend to be kind of large and lumpy, and we budget for them to arrive at a certain time, and they generally don't. <laughs> They're generally before or after we, we expect them. You're welcome. Right. Thanks very much. All right. <clears throat> um, next last uh, item on the agenda would be the custo uh, commissioner check-in. So just one last opportunity for commissioners to bring up any con concerns or issues or anything. Well, how about district energy? Yeah. Sure. Um, so where we are, a couple things since the last update. Uh, the Burlington District Energy nonprofit did receive uh, bids and is reviewing bids for the construction pricing. Um, we also, you know, we had noted in December that we were prepared to file uh, an Act 250. Um, I think what's happened is we got a little bit delayed by the holidays, but there's some activity going on with that um, that we're hoping to have a a uh, filing uh, related to Act 250, uh, hopefully I would say within the next week or so. Um, it may be that there is actually um, a kind of a less onerous path uh, relative to the permitting that, than we had expected. Um, so we're hoping to have a filing go in uh, sometime in the very, very near future um, that will uh, confirm that path uh, for the project. And then the remaining work, the very, very uh, key work uh, is happening following on the construction bids. We're trying to get updated pricing for the steam from McNeil. Uh, James actually just sent me today, uh, thank you James, uh, an updated term sheet uh, for us to review uh, related to that that we'll have to continue to discuss with the joint owners. Uh, we're looking to do um, uh, some more work on what options there might be at the state level for financing at a lower rate than what the market rate is. Uh, the continued hike in interest rates is not our friend uh, when we're looking at a debt finance project. Um, but there may be opportunities at the state for certain programs to help us with either a portion or all of the funding. And then we are uh, still waiting on the federal government to get back to us related to uh, NEPA review of Senator Leahy's uh, uh, appropriation and whether that can be um, a more limited review or whether they need to do a more thorough review, which would affect just the timing of that appropriation. So those are some of the key things that we're uh, in process on and hoping to continue to make progress uh, month by month here on district energy and get to a point in the near future where we uh, have clarity on the financials and can make a very clear uh, communication on that to customers and have them evaluate and make an ultimate determination if they're in or out. I, I guess I, I never heard of the, the NEPA evaluation of earmarked funds. Yep, it's uh, a thing. Anyway, uh, <laughs> what, what are the odds on that? 
Um, I think, I don't want to jump ahead of myself, I think the, um, there, there, are so, I, there are three levels of review, essentially. Uh, one would be the categorical exclusion. I think that we're still reviewing whether this might fit that, um, which would be a very, very limited thing. Um, if not, there might be uh, an environmental assessment, if I'm remembering my terminology for NEPA correctly, uh, which would be a more limited review, um, or you would have the more thorough review of being an environmental impact statement. That's the type of thing that they did for the Keystone Pipeline, for example. Uh, I can't necessarily anticipate that this project and the funding from the federal government would uh, necessitate that, particularly when we're talking about using primarily uh, existing right-of-way uh, for much of the piping for the project. But um, that's the federal government's determination to make, so we're, we're deferring and, and waiting to hear more on that. Well, you mentioned Keystone, and I'm just I using an example. <laughs> to say. I never heard of it. Yeah, I heard of it. Okay. Hopefully, that's an apples to oranges example. <laughs> Other input from commissioners. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to uh, just reiterate. Welcome, uh, Commissioner Bond, um, and I wanted to um, suggest to you what I did when I came on the board here was uh, take the time to, <clears throat> a lot of the things we talk about like really don't really come into light until you see them and feel them and touch them. Um, uh, I strongly suggest uh, going over and doing a tour of McNeil and of Winooski 1. <clears throat> I'm sure Paul would be more than happy to do that. Um, <clears throat> go out with the Forester. Go up to the Swanton uh, rail yard, um, go out with one of the engineers and take a look at substations and, think, and really get a feel for it. I did that and it really brought um, <clears throat> a lot of the things that we do here um, made more sense because I can tangibly know what that is. And so I suggest uh, perhaps taking any of the uh, any of these guys up on, you know, spend it, spend some time with James, you know, some of these folks. But I think that would be very helpful. And I did it and really brought things much more realistic to me. I've been there, so I mean. Anyway, welcome aboard, and that's all, that's all I've got. I would love to go on the McNeil. If you go on a McNeil tour, I would love to do that. So, keep me posted. But good job getting us done. Yeah, Basically thank you. Basically on time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I will, um, I will entertain a motion. I move that we adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We stand adjourned.